You know, it's interesting this morning as we were doing our devotions, we happened to start off about the church Philippi and what a neat church that was and where it was located and the fact that it was a really good church. And I made the comment that there's not a whole lot of good churches out there anymore. They're not, in fact, there are not a whole lot of good people out there anymore, good Christian men, you know, that you can depend upon. And I just kind of shared my heart about Pastor Chuck because I've met a lot of pastors. I've seen a lot of pastors, you know, well, they're in their environment. And I tell you, Pastor Chuck has, has just been such an example of holiness, uh, of peace and rest, faith and tr- he is definitely an example and you can see why God used him in such a mightily way in spite of all that was going on around him during the hippie movement, during a lot of the churches in the community coming down on him because he's allowing long-haired you know, kids to come to his church without suit and ties and so forth and yet this man withstood all of those things in the midst of that. <clears throat> he really did rest in the Lord. I really believe that. Pastor Dave, uh, once in a while, will share something personal about Pastor Chuck. And uh, one thing that he shared is that he was always concerned about the Word of God and how he taught it. And he said that oftentimes Chuck would come down and go, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, because I just didn't handle that Word just right. And yet you listen to him, and, and the Word just is so good, and yet he felt he did not handle it right you know and I, I think about myself like boy am I in trouble <laughs> you know if he doesn't think that he handled it right but he he truly did know how to rest in the Lord I think Greg Laurie asked him at the interview at Harvest uh, what are your concerns for Calvary Chapel and he's he basically said look the Lord is the one that started Calvary Chapel and the Lord is the one that will maintain Calvary Chapel it's all in the hands of the Lord It really is. So he had this rest in in God, right? And that's tonight's theme is rest in God. That's something that every single one of us should be able to do is to rest in the Lord, to trust in the Lord, to know that he, he has our back. He knows what he's doing. He'll take care of things. It might not work out the way that you planned it, but God has a better better way bigger picture that he sees you know we may not get this module you know maybe we will and it's teaching us patience maybe a lot of people left because it just hasn't happened yet you know and they weren't patient enough because uh, i know of people that like well, where's god why isn't he moving he's not here obviously and i think that god sometimes doesn't move purposely to weed out those <clears throat> that aren't having rest in god We are to rest in the plan of God. God loves us and he wants us to, he wants to bring us to peace in the, in in his presence. He he wants us to be in his presence at all time. And that is where we get his peace. When we are in his presence, how are you in his presence? When you worship him. A, A true sign of a believer is one who worships the Lord. One that just loves to sing raise their hands and just get into the presence of God. Matthew 11:27 says all things have been delivered to me by my Father, Jesus said. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the Son, or I'm sorry, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. It's all in the hands of the Father. And so then Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. (coughs) For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That is our Lord. He wants to give us rest in the midst of our struggles. He really does. That's his heart. I, I think it's us that don't want the rest that don't want to rest in God, trust in God. We want to handle it ourselves. In these next chapters, about eight chapters, we will be dealing with Jacob's walk. Jacob's walk. The Christian walk is, is interesting in that it really is our choice on how we walk, the Christian walk. We, we want to just live our faith out. We want to just live in a country and a nation where we can just live what we believe in. I think every man and woman wants that. Whether you're an atheist, Buddhist, 
Islam, whatever it is, they just want to live their, their lives the way that they feel that they are entitled to in America. And that's true. And they have every right to do so. We, we, we have to understand that. As a Christian, though, we have the right to do so too, to just walk our faith out, to live it, to believe what this says and just want to live it in our families, in our relationships, in our churches, in our communities, and just spread the news that Jesus loves them and that there is a way uh, to have eternal security because that's what's important is that eternal security. And so Jacob's walk was important. It wasn't a good walk. It definitely was not a good walk. But the Lord had a plan for his life. In this chapter here, we're going to see Isaac uh, bless Jacob one more time just to kind of give that final authority that, that it's been done, it's been settled, God's going to bless you, and through you the seed will come. And then we're going to see Esau, who had married uh, into the Canaanites, but now he, he's a little concerned about his relationship with dad. And so he decides that he's going to go to, to Ishmael, uncle there, uh, Ishmael, of the bond servant of Abraham, and marry a daughter from there, hoping that that will please dad. And then Jacob will head out to his uncle Laban's home, and he'll rest at a place where the Lord then will show him in a dream a ladder coming from heaven and angels coming up and down on the ladder. And then Jacob will worship and God will vow once again to Jacob. So let's go ahead and read the first five verses as, as Isaac blesses Jacob. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padamaram, to the house of Bethel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be an assembly of people and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Padamaram to Laban the son of Bethel the Syrian the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. So Isaac blesses Jacob and then he sends him to Laban, Rebekah's father's house basically in Panoram, to find a wife. So that the Lord, you need a wife in order to fulfill the blessing of the Lord that's on your life through Abraham because your seed needs to grow and you need to have many people in your seed. So he needs a wife and so he gets a wife from Rebecca's household and then the Lord confirms the blessing of Abraham upon Jacob Jacob will go about 40 miles journey to Bathsheba where he will rest Esau had threatened Jacob if you remember earlier in the chapter uh, 27 for stealing his birthright so Rebecca manipulates Isaac and sends Jacob to her brother's house to protect him basically and, and there's nothing like a mother's protection on his child they'll really do whatever it takes to protect uh, their children um, Satan has tried over and over again though to murder and to stop the Messiah's coming hasn't he and Esau basically was being used by Satan uh, to hopefully stop Jacob from being the receiver of the blessing of Abraham. And, and we know that of Satan. We know that when it happened in Genesis with Cain and Abel and how he motivated Cain to kill Abel thinking that, aha, I'll kill that bloodline and the Messiah you know, will not um, come. And not just Cain and Abel, but Jacob. And then we even see it happening with Herod uh, when he heard the Messiah was born and he went through the cities and killed all the children two years and younger. Obviously, Satan hates the Messiah. He hates the plan of God. And, and he will do whatever it takes to stop it. Uh, he will, you know... 
reach no end of it. He, he will pursue it until the Lord himself judges him at the great white throne judgment of God. And as soon as God in his righteousness begins to judge sin, God also in his mercy has promised a, a redeemer. Genesis 3, 3.15 said, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise your head, and thou shalt bruise thy heel. So even in Genesis we see the enemy attacking, but God says, I will protect that seed it's God's plan and God's plan will be fulfilled with the birth of Abel the devil began to oppose God Satan worked through Cain to kill his brother Abel was dead the line would have been broken the Messiah could never have been born at least that's what the devil thought but somehow God was able to work it out through the line of Seth And the devil didn't realize that Seth would be born. And so God has a way of making sure that his plans are fulfilled. He will manipulate. He will turn things around. All things work together for good. All things. Because God has a purpose. Every attempt to destroy the godly line by extinction or by sexual uh, contamination was an attempt by Satan to destroy the coming Messiah. You see it in the Old Testament. Even with David as a shepherd boy, it says a couple of times that some animals tried to get him. And the Lord gave him the strength to kill the animals and then attempted him with Bathsheba. And he fell. But still, the Lord's plan would prevail. Even the child dying, the first child dying. But it was Solomon who would take the lineage of Jesus Christ. So you see this attempt by Satan against the Messiah. And today, Satan's after you. He's after me. He hates Christianity. And you can see what he is doing in our world today. Right now, there are a lot of martyrs in um, these eastern countries that are um, being killed by Islam, Muslims being beheaded, crucified, Hundreds of them, hundreds of them are being killed that we don't even know because mainstream media will not tell us. But this is going on right now. And it's coming here. It may take 10 years, but it's coming here. It's already in Britain, and it's happening over there. Um, I heard of a a father killing a young lady uh, recently here in the United States. I don't know if you heard the latest on Hillary Clinton's clan, the WikiLeak latest email where they spoke about Catholicism and Christians and they spoke about Catholicism being a bunch of pretty much idiots don't know what they're doing they use big words to to make people think that they know something when they're they don't know a thing and then they spoke about Christianity saying that little and they used another word but illegitimate child because you know we were birthed from from Catholicism with Martin Luther and the Reformation came, and Protestantism came. And so they're just saying, basically, we're the little illegitimate children of Catholicism. So you hear this hatred towards Christians, hatred towards Catholicism, because they're apparently bunched in with us as Christians. So it's already there. And this is at the presidency level already there. And who knows where else. Now, how did it get to that point? I believe the enemy uses the school systems. I really do. I believe that when they took prayer out of school, the government got in there and started indoctrinating these kids. Started teaching them about communism, using specific words, defining them their way. And these kids then graduate, go go to liberal universities and continue to build on them. They move on, they get into the political arena, and now they're running our country exactly as they planned i think it was hitler that said if you can give me a child for so many years i'll give you someone that that will kill parents basically will turn in parents and so forth so he knows what he's doing and his attack is upon christianity Uh, satan was once holy we know that he was an angel of god a shining star He enjoyed the heavenly honors that God had given him, but through pride, ambition, uh, he wanted to be like the Almighty, and he fell. And he drew many, many other angels with him. 
and he is now the magnificent prince of the power of the air, the Bible says, the ungodly God of this world. He is identified in scripture by personal pronouns, uh, Lucifer, morning star, specific names uh, that are attributed to persons. He has certain activities that belong to him, like murder, lying, and those who deny the existence of a personal devil really have no biblical basis because the Bible teaches it beyond a shadow. Jesus spoke of him personally, that he exists, and he is an adversary of ours. And we need to be on our knees more than we are now to fight against the devil. You notice in verse 4 that, a, that <clears throat> the blessing of Abraham came to uh, Jacob there to your descendants with you that may inherit the land which you are a stranger which God gave to Abraham. There's a recognition here. Even though the enemy wants to destroy him, there's a recognition by God that, that Jacob is that person to take the blessing on and go forth. It was Hebrews 11:20 that said, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And so by faith Isaac knew that the anointing was on Jacob. He knew that God had blessed him from his mother's womb. So Isaac possibly realized that this might be the last time that he would have any kind of relationship uh, with his son Jacob. And so he takes this time to really bless him and pass that anointing to him. Then we come to verses six through nine as Esau marries the daughter of Ishmael. Now Esau witnesses uh, the blessings of Jacob. He, he's watching this and he, you know, you can imagine how he's getting upset over all of this. And so he goes and he marries some daughters of the Canaanites out of frustration and anger and bitterness and then he decides well maybe dad's going to reject me so I don't want to do that I'm going to come back and mar marry some of the daughters of Ishmael so now he gets into where he's having several wives um, Esau is really bitter here really bitter look at verse 6 Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Badamaram to take himself a wife from there and there as he blessed him he gave him charge, he gave him a charge saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padamaram. Also Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So, I, so Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebarth, to be his wife in the addition to the wives he had. So Esau, knowing that his father was not pleased, probably with the wives of the Canaanites, went to Ishmael and he marries this woman. Realizing his choice of the Canaanites' wives would upset his father, Esau takes the opportunity to try to ratify that relationship. And all he can do at this point is think carnally. I mean, he, he is working in the flesh here. He, he's not able to step back and, and say, Lord, help me in this situation. Now it's just all about what he thinks, what he believes, what he can do. And that's the work of the flesh. It's bad enough I've gone to the Canaanites and now my relationship is ruined. Lord, would you help me mend this relationship? Would you help me do the right thing? No, he's thinking, I know what to do. I'll just go to my father's you know, uncle, my uncle, and get women from there. And now I've got several wives and he's handling this all in his own power. And he starts polygamy. He wasn't the only one. Jacob ended up having a couple of wives because he was trying to marry one of Laban's daughters and was tricked, kind of. But he gets involved in it too. The Bible, in a sense, is a newspaper. It just reveals to us the facts. It doesn't condone what they're doing in polygamy, but it does reveal that it happens, you know, just like our world today. I don't think God condones what's happening in our presidency. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like watching, you know, I said it this morning, Batman and and you know uh the joker you know running for our office and we're all just sitting back going this is crazy but they got all the money and they can do it you know and and so you're just watching it's like what is going on here it's just crazy i i listened to um I believe it's max lucato he did a great article on this whole thing i didn't know this but his church is very liberal full of democrats so he has stayed out of the political thing uh, pretty much <clears throat> but 
I guess it finally came to a point where he just had to say something. He wrote, wrote this great article. It wasn't about the, about the people running. It was about God being in control. Great article. He said, whoever wins, God is still on the throne. And we act like though somehow one or the other is going to dethrone God and his plan has just been thrown out and now we're in big trouble. God has everything in perfect order. His plan will be fulfilled. We can, we can know for sure that according to the scriptures. And he did just a wonderful job there. And that is true. That is so true. And it could be that God wants us to go through uh, what it is that uh, he's planning for us. And so we need to just trust in the Lord at this time and know that God is in total control. Um, but he doesn't approve it. Neither did he approve it in the Old Testament. Now Esau's life choices made him very bitter towards Jacob, right? I mean, the guy steals his birthright. His dad can't give him the birthright. And mom takes brother away from him. And now there he is alone. He goes and marries Canaanites. They're upset about that. Now he marries some other women. Now he's got more wives. And now every, his whole life. And he begins to get bitter. You know what bitterness is, right? When you have no control, things aren't going your way. And you start getting bitter at people at situations, your emotions, they start controlling you, you start getting grumpy, upset all the time because you're a bitter person. It's not what God wants. He doesn't want us to be bitter. Uh, Lee Strobel said, bitterness inevitably seeps into our lives, into the lives of people who harbor grudges and suppress anger, and bitterness is always a poison. It keeps your pain alive instead of letting it, letting you deal with it and get beyond it. Bitterness sentences you to relieve the hurts over and over and over again. Isn't that true? That's what happens with bitterness. You just relive the situation over and you can't let it go. That's bitterness. And by the way, that's sin, the Bible says. Proverbs 27, 7 says, A satisfied soul loathe the honeycomb, but a hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. And that's crazy how bitterness literally grows. And it just grows to where any little thing you get bitter at. Now you're bitter at not just the person, you're bitter at other people, you're bitter at your community, you're bitter at your society, you're bitter at your world. Not a way to live. James 3.13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? That's a question. Ask yourself that. Who's wise? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. Do not boast. Isn't that what bitterness does? You begin to, oh, they're so wrong. Oh, that's not right. Oh, I have every right to be angry. I have, you know, I think we've seen that with some people, you know, who have been hurt by others in our community. They get bitter at these people. Yeah, they're wrong. Yeah, they're going to stand before God. But that bitterness starts to control them. It takes over their life and they live it over and over again. Thomas Kemp said, love alone makes heavy burdens light. And bears in equal balance things pleasing and displeasing. Love bears a, a heavy burden and does not feel it. And love makes bitter things tasteful be sweet. It's love that we should be looking for. And we know love covers a multitude of sin, the Bible says. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not rude. These, this is what love is. Learning to love one another. Really, that's the key to getting rid of bitterness as Emerson Harry said, bitterness imprisons life. Love releases it. Think about that. If you're a person that's bitter right now, think about how it has overcome you. Think about how it controls you. And you're really not in control of your own feelings and emotions. But it's love. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but... <laughs> Don't get me wrong, it is difficult to love. And sometimes if it's a certain individual, 
that has harmed you and you realize you're bitter towards them, you, you need to love them. I'm not saying you have to now go to their house and have supper with them all the time and treat them, you know. I'm just saying you need to forgive them. You need to go on with your life. You don't have to have a relationship with them. That's fine. Just don't hold the bitterness in you. Move on. Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you. And it says, with all malice. You know what malice is, right? You're so angry, you want it. But the opposite, with malice, put it away. As much as you put into it, you know, put more into getting rid of it than hanging on to it. In other words, accept God's plan for your life. Just accept God's plan for your life. God has you right where you are. The rich are rich and the poor are poor because God has them there. We live in the United States. We don't live in Iraq. God put us here. It's God's plan for our life. We live in Harupa Valley, city of Harupa Valley. He's put us here. I don't know why, but he did. He has a reason for it. Accept God's plan for your life. As simple as that. And when people disrupt that plan, that's okay. Okay. I love you, but I don't need to have a relationship with you. I got a plan. I got to fulfill that. So go away. I love you. Just leave me alone. You know, and move on and go forward. Because you're not going to get along with everybody. And the people you do get along, embrace them, love them. Bring them to your side. Pour into them if you can. But you won't be able to do that with everybody. But the ones that you can, you know, pour into them. But don't waste your time with those people that are just wasting your time, basically, and bringing up all the anger and bitterness. Get rid of that stuff. And you see that in Esau. And it just got to the point where it was just too much for him. You can almost feel it in him. Now back to Jacob as he, he's leaving. <clears throat> so while he's on his way to his uncle's town, he rests a while as it's late in the day. And Jacob dreams of a ladder that's dropped down from heaven and angels are ascending and descending on it. And the Lord speaks to Jacob and encourages him and then he validates you know, his birthright. Uh, he assures him, I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. God has a plan for every single one of us. <clears throat> and he's working that plan out. Do you know a, a plan... When you make a plan, there, there's a beginning, and then there's a, a journey, and then there's the end of the plan, right? That's what a plan is. Now, we make a plan. That's usually how it works out. If you're building a house, then here's the plan. Let's, let, let's start the process. It may take anywhere from a week to two years, like in our process. And then, and then let's build this, and then there's an end. God says he's the author and finisher of our faith. He, he authored us and he's working our faith out and then he's going to end it. That's his plan. The problem that we have is we want to know the end because that's the best part of the plan, right? Is when they finally at the end, hurrah, the building's built, you know, the bonuses are given, whatever the plan was, it's all been fulfilled. Well, God's plan isn't, ending in this world it's ending when we get to heaven and we're in his presence eternally face to face with our savior so we're somewhere in the middle working out all this plan you see that and so we need to realize where we're at is right where god's plan is at and just accept where you're at as god's plan he has you right there for a reason so just live your life live your faith out where you're at whether it's at work, whether, whether you're in the church or whether you're a, a wife or whether you're a husband, live your faith out right there. God has a plan. Fulfill those things that he's brought to you. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haram. Knowing that, of course, Esau was planning to kill him, he, he goes on to run. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and he laid down in that place to sleep. So he had a little pillow there on a stone. Some stones are nice. When you go lay out there in Bishop, you know, and you find a stone, you just lay your head on just just perfect and you just knock right out. And he is tired. 
It's late. He's running away from home. And, you know, so he takes the time to just nap away. <clears throat> now he has this dream as he's laying down. A dream, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and it popped top reached to heaven and there the angels of God ascending and descending on it I don't have a whole lot of time to talk about this but he's having this vision <clears throat> and the heavens open up now he's worried he's scared he doesn't know what God's plan is though it's been told to him already by his father twice and his mother you're going to take that birthright and so he, he knows it, but yet he's not believing it, right? And so he's now tired. Uh, he's sleeping. He's wondering, where am I going? What am I doing? I think he's scared at this point. He's got fear in him. And so God is going to comfort him while he's asleep there. And he sees the heavens open, and then a ladder comes down, and angels are kind of going up and down between heaven. That's an interesting picture, isn't it? It tells us that angels have access to both realms, heaven and earth, right? And so they can come at any time. I wonder uh, how many angels are here right now. We can't see them. It's the spiritual world. But how many angels are here right now coming up and down in, in heaven? It doesn't mean that our loved ones come up and down. Don't get that put in there because the text doesn't say that. It never says that our loved ones can come down to heaven. Do they see us? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say either. Uh, do they help us? The Bible doesn't say either that they help us. They're in heaven. They're complete. Uh, they already know God's plans fulfilled. And in fact, they're wondering, if anything, why you're so worried. Because <laughs> they're like, wait till you get here. You know, you're going to just go, wow, I worried for nothing. So um, <clears throat> they're not involved. They don't help us because it's the Spirit that helps us. It's God that helps us. It's Jesus that helps us. All that other stuff is a lie of the enemy to get you off of your relationship with God and the Holy Spirit in, in that relationship, put you on angels, put you on your relative or your grandmother here and there to help. No, it's God. He is our priority. He's our number one. He's the one we go to. Uh, we go to him in prayer, in need. And Paul says it all over the place. If you have any desires or need, go pray to God. Pray in the name of Jesus. He's a meter. One, there's only one meter between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. So these angels are going up and down. Well, what is he, what is he seeing there? Well, when you go to the New Testament, um, I believe it's First Peter. Nope. I didn't want it. Jesus mentions this ladder uh, to Nathan in the New Testament. Well, let's read verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, uh, the land on which you're, you lie, I will give you to you and your descendants. <clears throat> John 1, 51, Jesus said about this picture, okay, you have God looking down. And he said to him, most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending, descending upon the Son of Man. So he gives the same picture. The angel descending upon the Son of Man. So he reveals to himself, to Jacob, as God of his Father. The one who would continue the covenant promise through him. Jesus is saying to him, like Jacob who had that dream where the angels are coming up and down, that promise was given to Jacob. He is a seed of Abraham. He will now have seeds. So now the Son of Man John chapter 151. Now the Son of Man stands here and the angels are ascending down. I am the seed. I am the Messiah is what he's saying to those that are listening to him at that time. So it is a picture of the Messiah. It's a promise to Jacob. I have a plan for your life. You are a seed that will bring forth the seed in the future, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so he shows this picture, and then Jesus comes, and he refers back to the picture that is speaking of me, the seed that came from Jacob. That is me. And that's the picture that he's shown there. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to the land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So no doubt Jacob had a lot of feelings of doubt here. He's running away. He's fearful. Wondering, is this going to 
happen or not. He might have been thinking that there were a lot of struggles and uncertainties in the future. Who knows? You know, mom's sending me away. Who knows when I'll see her? Dad is sending me away. Probably never see him again. He's pretty old and blind. I'll never see my brother and my family. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainties here. And it was a long way to Haran. And a lot of things could happen between there. Esau could, you know, come by and possibly attack him. He was taking a different route. He wasn't taking a shorter route. He was taking another route, hoping that Esau wouldn't know that he was going that route. We notice some things about God here when he speaks to Jacob. First thing is that God promised Jacob that he would be present with him. He'd always be there. I'll never leave you or forsake you. God is always with us. He's always with us. He loves us enough to make sure that his presence is with us. So he knows what's going on in our lives. Secondly, God promised that protection. He promised because his plan will be fulfilled. And so Jacob, don't fear. Don't worry. I have a plan for your life. Thirdly, God promised Jacob preservation and that he would return to the promised land. When you read the rest of the stories of the eight chapters, you'll see that Jacob, after going through seven years of of getting a wife, he then returns after Laban running after him too and accusing him of taking his idols. Uh, He returns and Esau meets him. And so there, uh, as Esau's meeting him, he kind of runs and he gets away and he actually wrestles with God. And as he's wrestling with God, God touches his hip and all of a sudden it shrinks. The shank shrinks in his hip and now he's crippled. I know exactly how Jacob felt in my hip. Exactly. And that's when he wrestled with God. And that was where God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Jacob meaning surplanter, manipulator, taking things in the flesh to Israel, which means ruled by God in the Hebrew. And so God said, Jacob, you will now be ruled by me. I will be your king and you will obey me. You'll notice that as you read about Jacob, once in a while God will say, Jacob, (laughs) what are you doing? Back in the flesh there. And then he'll say, Israel, you know, the blessings are on him. God loved him so much and his plan would be fulfilled. He would preserve him. God's going to preserve you until that day that he says it's time to come home. He will. He will. Because it's God's plan. And finally God reiterates to Jacob his promise that he would complete his work that he had begun. Then 16 through 22 as Jacob then worships the Lord. I love this part. Jacob was not expecting the Lord to be in that place there. I mean again he was fearful. He's running away. All of a sudden God shows up. And God does that. He just shows up in those times where you're going Lord where are you? And you know that that never gets old of experiencing God showing up because we're human and we forget so fast and that's why Paul and even Peter said it's not tedious that I, that I remind you of these things and so being reminded of these things is wonderful so we don't lose hope but God shows up in in those places in those times I know that we get confused cuz life is that way sometimes I, I, and I'm thinking of uh, of the grandma whose daughter died. and I mean, what confusion there is there because they don't understand why God didn't show up at that time. But that was God's timing to take away that little girl and grandma, another little girl, and timing of four. That's God's timing. That's God's choice. That's God's decision. And God shows up after the fact sometimes, like with Forrest boy he showed up didn't he he shows up and he continues to show up and he'll continue to show up until he's done with that part of his plan obviously Forrest is in heaven plan is complete in his life and he did all the things in the center of it as God had planned he shows up believe me I've experienced it from time to time where God just shows up there was one time where we were really in financial struggle and I started looking into bankruptcy I was going to pull a Donald Trump and so I looked into bankruptcy and how to go about bankruptcy and and I I didn't want to go 
into bankruptcy. I don't care if it's legal. I don't care if it's a loophole. That's not my character. I want to pay my bills. I'm responsible for making them. I'm going to pay them. You know, so so that's just the way that I am. And so I just start, Lord, you got to really help me here. I don't know what to do. I mean, we were we, we were literally, literally living on a credit card that that we would make a $300 payment. And so you have $300 available. You'd spend it and then you had to wait till you had that $300 payment, pay it. And then we had $300 available. Every month we lived like that for several years. And I just find that we can't do this anymore. Just can't do it. And I said, Lord, you're going to have to do something. And I'd been working for Edison as a uh, single face testman probably for, I would say, 14 years, maybe 15 years. So I didn't see any possibilities. And all of a sudden, this job opens up. And it was perfect. I had to take a test, had to go through the interviews and so forth. And I just prayed, Lord, help me pass this test. And so he had, at that time, had, had caused me to get interested in Hank Canagram's memory system, where he takes pictures, and he makes these pictures into words, and then you memorize things. And so I was so interested in that, because it helps you memorize the Bible, uh, the way that he does it. <clears throat> like, I think of Long John's, you know what Long John's are for men? That's the Gospel of John, Long John's. And so this is pictures, what he uses. Um, to remember things. And so I did it with my test. I took pictures and took all my formulas and made them into pictures. And right when I got to my test, I remembered the pictures, wrote down the formulas all down, and I aced the test. And that's God. And I got the job. I became a journeyman. And I had so much overtime that we paid everything off. And then the Lord said, it's time to quit. And so I paid everything off, got a brand new car, got a brand new air conditioner, set myself up, and, you know, the rest, rest you know. God shows up at those unusual times when you really need him. He just does. And that's just one story. I have a lot of stories like that where God has, has always showed up, and I'm sure you do too. He's just that way. Be reminded, whatever you're going through right now, God will show up. And so Jacob didn't realize God was going to show up and he showed up and he uh, solidified uh, <clears throat> his plan. Jacob awoke, verse 16, from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Again, as he's viewing this beautiful picture of heaven opening the ladder and angels coming forth. And Jacob rose early in the morning and took a stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. This was his way of marking the place and engaging in a relationship with the Lord. A consecration is what oil represents. It's a separation unto the Lord. He begins to worship the Lord. We see three characteristics here of Jacob. First, true conversion is seen in his worship. You'll know when a person is converted because he'll want to worship the Lord. He'll want to. Does that make sense? See, when you truly get converted, when your heart truly has surrendered to the Lord, you want to worship Him. You want to learn about Him. You want to be in His presence all day long. You want to sing songs unto Him. It's a relationship. I always liken it to falling in love with someone. You all know what I mean about that. Right? You've fallen in love with a person and now you're thinking of that person all day long. You can't get that person out of your mind. You want to call that person. You want to write a letter to that person. Email, Facebook them, message them, tweet them. On Twitter, I got it right. So, because you're in love and you want to be in their presence at all times. You have a picture of them. They're your friend. That's how God should be to the person that converts to Christianity. All of a sudden, they're in love. They are totally surrendered and in love with him. Do you feel that way? If you don't, you should. If you don't, you should start praying and asking God to reveal himself to you even more. 
so that you can fall deeper, 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 deeper in love with him. Deeper in love with him. I'm not saying you're not saved, you haven't been converted. I'm saying you need to worship him. Jacob worshiped him. Whether it's singing, lifting hands, building a monument, like Jacob did here, his heart truly believed in the Lord and he was giving thanksgiving. Look at verse 19. He called the name of the place Bethel, but the name of the city had been Luz previously. Now Bethel, that word there means El, for the word God, so it's house of God, house of the Lord. Luz means separate. I was separated from God, thought Jacob, but now I realize I am in the house of the Lord. The same is true of you. There are people who, if they caught wind that they're at some Bible study, would probably be shocked about you being at a Bible study. They knew you 10 years ago, two weeks ago, but since then you've moved to Luz or Bethel and everything just changes. It just does. Now you're in the house of the Lord. You were separated before. You didn't care about church. You didn't care about serving. You didn't care about loving people. You were doing your own thing. But all of a sudden, you're in the house of the Lord. Don't you feel good when you come here? And it's not the house or the building. It's the fact that it's the people that are gathering here. It's the fact that we invite God here. And it's not that he's not here. When we leave, he's probably not here. But when we get here, he shows up because he's in our presence or we're in his presence. But there's just something about gathering. together. I love it. It's the best place to be. I could be here all day long. This morning was just a blessing it blows me away at devotions just having so many here and then everybody decided let's let's just have breakfast someone went out and bought burritos and so we're all setting up tables and having breakfast again i'm like man i love this this is what church is about it's like we're all family we're all sitting around the table eating burritos and chili and just fellowshipping and talking it was beautiful i would love to live like that the rest of my life i know i'm living it right i live it every day and it's beautiful. And we invite you all to join us. Come on down and be part of it. Notice Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Now, a couple of things here that we have to definitely observe. He, he's praying, could be, a true conversion here because he'll be my God, but he adds some stipulations to this, right? If if you do this, if you do that. Now, understand it's the law. And in the law, if you keep my commandments, then, of course, I will bless you according to the law. Jacob isn't just saying, okay, God, if you do this, then I'll be, or I'll let you be my God. No, the idea here is that if you'll have me, God, great, I will be yours and you will be mine is what he's saying. That's basically what he's saying here. Look, if you want me, you'll bless me, and you're my God, and I will praise you. And that's the other aspect of once you are converted is that Jesus becomes your God, and there is no other gods besides him, nor will there ever be. And when another God tries to come in, you know that that God's false, and it's all about Jesus. When you get called you're not converted until you get called a Jesus freak. I just made that up. Don't believe it. <laughs> when someone calls you a Jesus freak, then you know, uh-oh, I'm really into Jesus then. I've had people call me that. You're a Jesus freak. Someone is, had to, talked to my pastor one time and said, all he does is talk about Jesus, 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 this, Jesus, that. It's like, can you tell him not to talk about Jesus too much? <laughs> they actually went to my pastor and told him that. When you get... Those type of accusations, you're on track, believe me. When people start looking, why are you always talking about God? Why are you always inviting people to church? You're right on track. You're right on track. Because you're changed, and you want to be in the house of the Lord, and you want Jesus, and it's all about him. You're my God now. And I love that, my God. I know he's your God, but he's mine first. He's mine first. Let's close. Let me just say a couple of things here to close. It's easy to get distracted. 
in this world. We can become busy. We can get involved in the world. We can even suffer, fall into trials, tribulations, and struggle, even get bitter. But we can also rest. And rest is its opposite of the things of this world, which just causes unrest. Philippians, and we read it this morning, verses six or seven says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, let your thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. We can find that rest when we pray to the Lord. Be anxious for nothing, Paul said. Yes, nothing, nothing. When you start getting anxious, Cast it away. I'm not anxious. I'm not going to get anxious about you. It really is a cast away. I think the devil sometimes holds us with anxiousness. Oh, I know you might have anxiety problems. And it's medically proven. I understand that. The Bible says don't be anxious. It's what God's word says. So pray to God. Why am I so anxious? Lord, take that anxiousness away. It could be your kids, your job, your health, your struggles, finances, whatever concerns you have. It could even be driving in a car and you're anxious because you're going to die. Who knows what it is? There's nothing, nothing, nothing means nothing. Exclude it completely in that statement. There's nothing that should make you anxious because God is with you all the way. So it's a matter of prayer and getting into the presence of the Lord to remove that anxiousness. And I, I know I'm going to hear it, but I really feel anxious. I know you do. I, I totally understand. I get anxious from time to time. I get fearful from time to time. But those are the things you need to cast away and keep giving them to God. That's why he says, make your requests made known to God. Keep praying. The verse goes on one step further to tell us what to do instead of being anxious, but in everything in prayer, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts, minds through Christ Jesus. That's peace. You get peace. And in order to get peace, you don't have to finish the so-and-so project or receive the so-and-so blessing but to be anxious for nothing and casting everything to the Lord through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. It is his job to care for you. Peter said, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. So there's a resting that comes in him through our prayer. We need to rest in him. And that has to deal with faith and trust in God that he has your, his, your life in his hands. That's where the anxiousness goes away when you know that he has your life in his very hands. That's something to consider. <clears throat> I think that that's something that, that you can do through prayer. By letting all those anxious thoughts, whether it's children, whether it's life and financials, be given to the Lord. I know recently I got a little anxious with our finances uh, to the point where it was really getting me and I just finally said, Lord, you need to take this from me. I have no answers. I'm trusting in you and I'm expecting you to show up. I have no answers, Lord, and so just take this away. Just take it away. And it's through prayer that he takes these things away and he did. But then you start thinking on it again, right? And that's when it comes back and you gotta again cast it away. You gotta cast it away and trust in the Lord. And you'll find more than often that nothing changes when you worry or get anxious. Nothing changes. It really doesn't change anything. Just stop getting anxious. Trust in God. He cares for you. He has you right in his hands.